Uh, hey, world history kiddos. I hope things are going okay. This is going to be our third lesson, and it's actually going to be a pretty deep lesson. I'm going to try uh, to, to, through distance learning, whoa, get out of there. I'm going to try through distance learning to, um, uh, to, to really go over some very heavy concepts. So uh, again, uh, you've already, if you're on the, if you're listening to this, you've already gotten to this page here. But as a reminder, I do have a brief housekeeping video to watch today. If you get a, a chance, uh, right now we're doing the lesson three video. Once we're done with this video, there is a brief, um, a brief sort of assessment. It's a six question Google form. And as you are uh, doing this little assessment, feel free uh, to use any textbooks or I actually linked to you the slides we're going to be going over today. Uh, these slides, you can find them in our Google class. I just posted them this morning and I have a, a link here. So feel free to look at the slides we're going over as you're answering this assessment. Consider it like an open book, open note quiz. Uh, so like I said, this is a pretty heavy lesson. And um, so we're going to go ahead and get into it right now. So obviously this whole unit is about Nazis and Nazis, uh, frankly, are awful. Um, and it is interesting, though, how a country like Germany, a democracy, is going to let the Nazis come to power. So the last lesson was about the Beer Hall Putsch. Again, Putsch in German simply means coup. And this is going to be in 1923 when Hitler and his Nazi party is still very young and they try to overthrow the government. And hopefully you have watched the video, the Ed Puzzle video. If you haven't, make sure you do that. The big takeaway from the Beer Hall Putsch is that at the time, the Nazi party wasn't a big party, but they were very militant, meaning they had a lot of ex-army people in it uh, from World War I who felt disenfranchised with government, um, where they're called the Brown Shirts, and they're going to try to take over the, the um, government of the city of Munich with the uh, hope that eventually they could take over all of Germany in a violent revolution, a coup, so to speak. Um, it doesn't work. So the big takeaway is it doesn't work. Uh, but what's ironic is that even though it's a huge failure, failure, Hitler becomes more popular after this failed coup because during his trial, um, there are judges on the Munich uh, court that are sympathetic to Hitler's nationalist cause, and they let him speak. And uh, he is so persuasive in his oratory that he gets the bare minimum sentence of five years. And then he actually gets released after nine months in a very uh, comfortable, uh, quote unquote, prison. At that time, when he went to prison, he was able to write a book called Mein Kampf. And uh, as he's writing this book, Mein Kampf, it literally translates into My Struggle. And it's what we call an autobiography. It's sort of a book in which Hitler explains himself, explains his views of society and the world, and explains what he thinks should happen um, when he takes control or when the Nazis take control of the German government. And I'm going to read a couple excerpts from Mein Kampf uh, that show sort of uh, these uh, racist and xenophobic ideas that Hitler had. And um, I'm not going to read them necessarily word for word, uh, but essentially what Hitler is going to say, he is going to say, we are experiencing terrible economic uh, crises, crises right now uh, here in 1923. It's again, shortly after World War I, there's hyperinflation. And um, he, uh, the country of Germany feels embarrassed by the Treaty of Versailles. And he is going to say that it's not the fault of the Germans that all these bad things are happening. He is going to find a scapegoat, a group of people that um, who um, have to take the blame or who are given blame for bad things happening. And the people that he scapegoats are Jewish people and communists. He's going to say that all of the bad things happening in Germany are the result of the uh, Jew people of Jewish faith and of communists. And he actually links the two together. He says that they're essentially the same thing. And um, so communism, whenever you see the word Marxism, you can kind of replace that with communism. And he says that the Jewish doctrine of Marxism, the Jewish belief of communism, so he's saying that Jew Judaism and communism are essentially linked together. And he says that Judaism and communism de denies the value of personality in man. It contests the significance of nationality and race and thereby withdraws from humanity the premise of its existence and its culture. So that's kind of a heavy sentence. And what it's saying is that the Jewish faith and communists in particular, they want to get rid of nationalities. 
they want to get rid of races. And in the Nazi ideology, that is like awful to them because the Nazis believe that nationality is the most important thing and that race is the most important thing. They believe that the German people, and in particular the Aryan race of the German, uh, Germanic people, is superior to all others. And the idea of, of trying to get rid of people's nationality and race to them is, is, is just uh, too much for, for them to, to bear. The uh, German people are going to sort of buy into it, and they're going to see as though uh, this, this sort of group of secret Jewish leaders and secret communist leaders are, are in our government, and they're trying to get rid of, of 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 our German nationality and, and of our superior Aryan race. It's very xenophobic, very racist. And essentially he's saying that if we let the Jewish people and the communists take over, we are going they're going to destroy our planet. And that's what this this uh, little sentence from the book says down here that if the Jew is victorious over the other peoples of the world, the Jewish crown will be the funeral wreath of humanity. And this planet will, as it did thousands of years ago, move through the uh, ether devoid of men. He's essentially saying the Jewish people are trying to destroy humanity. And if we let them, um, essentially our world will just, I guess, you know, stop having humans. We'll all be dead. And down here, he, he further goes on to say that um, right now the Jewish people are, are trying to um, say that they're democratic and that they're trying to take control of our democratic government, meaning the Weimar government. Uh, but once they come, once they take over, they're going to turn into tyrants and they're going to try to enslave all of us great German Aryans. That's sort of what he's saying down here. And this is very ironic because he's essentially projecting exactly what he will end up doing. The idea that once they take over, they will turn into tyrants. That's exactly what he does. So there's a psychology, we call that projection. Uh, but regardless, you can see how off the rails this is. It's just nuts. Um, and uh, in general, um, most Germans might not have fully agreed with all of it, but a lot of Germans really like the idea of this sort of nationalism that, yeah, we Germans are, are superior, we are the best, and, and we have been betrayed. People were able to sort of buy into that. So unfortunately, um, there are enough people in Germany who buy into this that the Nazi party, uh, even though it never becomes a huge party in the 1920s in Germany, uh, it gains legitimacy. People sort of uh, even if they don't agree with all of it, and even if they think Hitler's a little, you know, a little off the rails, um, they, they, they still like some of the things he's saying. They still like this idea of a strong Germany. And one of the things Hitler really excelled at was the ability to, to uh, give oratory. So in a second, I'm going to play this, uh, it's about a 30 second clip of uh, one of Hitler's speeches in 1936. He's giving it to the uh, Krupp factory in Germany. And what you can see is that um, he is very vocal and, and bombastic in his presentation. He waves his arms. It's sort of like a spectacle, very similar to, he, again, he models himself a lot out of, after Mussolini in Italy at the time. And you need to remember that back in the 1920s and 30s, there wasn't television really. There were movie reels, um, but there wasn't television. So if you really wanted to hear someone you kind of had to go see them in person. And when you would see Hitler in person and hear him, either on the radio or in person, uh, he was impassioned. And it was just something, uh, someone that um, people naturally were drawn to. Uh, so we'll go ahead and watch this just so you get an idea of, of what Hitler was, was, was like when giving his speeches. And why? Where did it just go? Hmm. Okay, let's do that again. Du, meine Arbeit! Für richtig hältst, ob du glaubst, dass ich fleißig gewesen bin, dass ich gearbeitet habe, dass ich mich in diesen Jahren für dich eingesetzt habe, dass ich anständig meine Zeit verwendet habe im Dienste meines Volkes. Gib du jetzt deine Stimme ab. Wenn ja, dann tritt für mich ein, so wie ich für dich eingetreten bin. And so there you can see, I have no idea what he was saying, but my heavens, was it impassioned. And you can kind of see why people might be drawn to that. Uh, and then when you'd see him on film reels, sort of just, just this um, almost, um, this, this man possessed with energy, uh, he became someone that, that uh, German people um, sort of um, would admire a little bit. So like I said, though, um, after he gets out of prison, he is going to try his best to get the uh, Nazi party to grow. 
And in general, the Nazi party does grow a little bit more after the Beer Hall Putsch. They do gain um, a little bit more influence and power. Um, and one of the things Hitler does to do that is he sort of tries to make the Nazis, he distance himself from these the brown shirts of the Nazi party. The brown shirts were sort of the militant part of the Nazi party that were uh, would engage in violence and thuggery. Um, and instead, he um, tried to use more political means like trying to win elections and stuff like that with some leaders like Hess and Himmler and Goebbels and Goring, which we'll go over later. And um, in general, he had a little bit of success in the 1920s, um, but it really wasn't uh, a huge victorious party. It wasn't like a major player in German politics through uh, most of the 20s. But as you know, in 1929, that all changes. In 1929, the Great Depression hits, and as you remember when we discussed earlier, it hits Germany harder than almost any other country in Europe. And so people in Germany, they're sort of knocked right back to square one, just like what they were after, um, after World War I. They're hungry, they're starving, they're desperate, they're poor, and when, when people are fearful and hungry, um, they, they typically look for some leadership. They look for someone who they think can get them out of problems. And in particular, they don't want complicated answers or complicated solutions. When people are met with, you know, a lot of immediate problems, they want immediate answers. And the Nazi party, they gave that immediate answer. They said, hey, you want to know why things are wrong? It's because of the communists and the Jews. That's why things are wrong. Hey, and if you, if you elect us, we are going to turn Germany great again. We are going to make Germany an amazing country. And the people of Germany are going to start to really buy into that more wholesale than they were before. I do want to do a real quick application of this to today. Uh, right now, we are in the midst of very uh, scary times, very anxiety-producing uh, uh, times. And uh, I know there's a lot of fear. There aren't a lot of answers. And the solutions seem very complex. The, ans the, the reasons for all what's going on economically and in terms of um, the medical biology behind this virus are very complex. And um, unfortunately, it's, it's in these moments of fear that sometimes uh, we look to simple answers that cause some, some disturbing problems. And so one of the things that's been happening in the news I've noticed is that we're starting to blame the Chinese people uh, for this virus. We're starting to call it like the Chinese virus or some stuff like that. Um, now, the, the virus, from what we know, did start in China. But um, the idea of blaming it on Chinese people or people of Asian descent, it's, it's, it's not Nazism per se, it's not quite the same thing as scapegoating the Jewish people for the German problems, but it's a step in that direction. I've been reading stories of a lot of Asian Americans who are having things thrown at them or um, being sort of verbally assaulted uh, because people are, what, for whatever reason, they believe that the uh, Asian people, that the Chinese people in particular, um, either engineered this virus or somehow helped to carry or have made this virus more contagious or something. And uh, again, that's that's just simply not accurate. This virus uh, attacks anyone from anywhere. It doesn't matter their, their race. It doesn't matter their religion. It doesn't matter their ethnicity. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's think long and hard before we start doing that. It's no different than a couple of years ago. Uh, there used to be a, a virus called the swine flu. Uh, it started here in America uh, because of some of the terrible conditions that our livestock live in. And uh, we didn't call the swine flu the American pig virus. You know, and it's not like Americans were trying to propagate some world disaster. So uh, when you see and hear this idea, well, let's blame the Chinese for this. Um, that's 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 scapegoating a little bit. So be careful of that. It doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, the the virus did start, as far as we know, over in China. Um, but it, it doesn't. It's not a reflection of the Chinese people, and it sure as heck isn't a reflection of American citizens who are of Asian descent. So a uh, little public service announcement there. I just wanted to show there are some links um, between um, between. Germany as it turns into a more xenophobic nationalist state um, and things that we in our own lives do today. And again, I'm not saying anyone's a Nazi or anything like that, but it's a step in that direction we got to be careful of. So again, after the Great Depression, 
the Nazis are going to begin, become more and more popular because, again, the German people are just going to sort of turn to this Nazi ideology as a simple answer for com, uh, complex problems. And they're going to win a lot of the seats in what's called the Reichstag. Uh, this is the German word. Essentially, it's uh, uh, the Reichstag is what we call the German parliament. It's their legislative body. It's what makes laws in theory. It's similar to like our Congress, like we have a House of Representatives and a Congress. It's similar to that. And so the Nazis are going to win a large number of seats in the Reichstag. Um, and because the Nazi party became so popular in the 1932 election, the president of Germany, President Hindenburg, is uh, going to try to create a government that uh, gives the Nazis a lot of say with, with the hope that it will calm down the German people, that everyone can work together, Nazis and non-Nazis alike, um, to, to try to figure out some answers of the, the, the uh, economic problems that they were facing. So he agreed to name Hitler the chancellor of the uh, Reichstag. Essentially, he becomes the leader of the uh, Reichstag. It's sort of like Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House of the House of Representatives. It's a similar concept, not necessarily apples to apples, though. But so Hitler is put in charge of the Reichstag. And an amazing thing happens shortly after he is put in charge of the Reichstag. The actual building where this parliament meets, uh, it catches fire and is destroyed. Uh, no one knows for sure who did it, um, but Hitler was able to use this catastrophe to stoke the fear of the German people. Uh, and essentially, he and the Nazis and a lot of the uh, members of the Reichstag, a.k.a. the German parliament, um, they blamed the entire thing on uh, communists. They said that there were com uh, communist terrorists, essentially, in Germany who were trying to destroy the German Republic. And so what the Reichstag did, uh, to because they were so worried that there was this, you know, the all these... Um, all these communists and, and all these um, enemies of Germany all over, they decide to take drastic actions and they pass the Enabling Act, which essentially said, Hitler, do whatever you have to do, but you, we're going to give you every power that, you, that we can so that you can stop these enemies of, Ger enemies of Germany. You can stop these communists. And this is how the Nazis uh, essentially take over Germany. Uh, they gain democratic power through elections. They use the fear um, of the German people after the Great Depression to get elected to, uh, to their parliament. Um, because so many Nazis are in charge of parliament, Hitler gets to become the chancellor of the Reichstag. And then he uses a national catastrophe to take control and complete power with the will of a democratically elected parliament, mind you, uh, to take complete, com complete power. Shortly after, um, the Reichstag fire within uh, a year or so, uh, President Hindenburg dies, and Hitler essentially says, well, we don't need a president. I'm just going to be the supreme leader. I'm going to take over. Um, and that's when Hitler essentially, uh, for lack of a better word, became the uh, supreme leader, the, the uh, complete controller of, of Germany. And um, so one thing, the last thing I want to show you, the American, um, or I should say the, the Masonian uh, Holocaust Museum has a little bit of a 60-second video about the Reichstag fire. It's, it, it does a nice job of really explaining um, the fire a little bit and, uh, and what the results of this, this fire was. So we'll watch this together. So again, that's a pretty short video, but it does a nice job of uh, showing some images and the results of the Reichstag fire. 
Um, and so that pretty much wraps up our lesson today over the rise of the Nazis in Germany. Um, like I said, it's a pretty deep lesson. And uh, about once or two, uh, two times a week, I'm going to try to do some of these deeper dives in our, um, uh, in our history classes. Um, so uh, once you are done with this, again, if you go back to the actual lesson plan, I do want each one of you to take this um, real quick assessment. And you are more than welcome to use your slides. Consider it open book, open note. And um, just some pretty quick questions to make sure you understand the main points of the day le today's lesson, and then a little bit of a feedback question as well. And that pretty much wraps it up. So again, I hope everyone's doing all right. Uh, tomorrow I have at least a uh, quick housekeeping video. Uh, probably won't do too much more in terms of content. I think today was a, a pretty good a pretty good day to, to leave it on for now. And yeah, that'll pretty much do it. I hope you guys are doing all right and girls. Hope everyone's doing all right. Um, hang in there. Uh, we're going to get through this. And uh, if nothing else, uh, don't look for simple answers. Let's not be scapegoating people for the, the situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, let's do the best we can. Listen to the experts and, um, and we'll make it out of this okay. Uh, have faith in each other. Have faith in humanity. Have faith uh, in your fellow man. All right. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and I'll talk to you later. Bye.